Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Got a special treat for you today as I am joined by Andy Jazz, keyboardist and composer Kate Dundon. Kate has spent many years recording with a trio and recording for film and movies. But now she's back on doing her solo thing. And she also worked in academia. So we're going to be talking to her about her story and everything that she's up to. So Kate Dunton, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Curtis. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, you covered a lot of it. (laughs) But um, my name's Kate. I'm a keyboardist. Um, Yeah, I've, uh, I've had a long securitist path on this music business and I'm still going um but yes at the beginning there was um there was a lot of teaching I even tried a little bit of music marketing more of the sort of business side of things um and then yes for a while I was performing uh as a trio and I called it trio Kate and now I've started focusing on more of the solo artist concept not that I'm playing by myself but that you know, it's not so much trio specific, but just focusing on my own music and whatever the band happens to be. And currently, I just released an album and um, there's a lot of fun shows coming up. And so I'm really focusing on the creative side of things right now. Okay, so what got you started in music? Oh, gosh. Um, Well, you know, I was so young, I don't really even remember, but there was a piano in the house and I was very interested in it. And my folks got me piano lessons. And so I did that for a long time. And honestly, I didn't really even start doing the jazz thing until college. I don't think I even really knew what improvisation was, to tell you the truth, until I got to college. But my family's not particularly musical. So, you know, where where the actual genetic bug came from, I'm not sure. But certainly the interest and the passion has been there forever. And I just have kept along with it. So you also worked in, and recorded in movies and films. So so tell us uh, how that came about and, and some of the mu- movies and films that you've done some work for. Maybe we can yeah, check them out. Absolutely. Um, so this whole thing started because of a composer and a conductor orchestrator who I met named Tim Davies. And I first met him because he has a big band and I have played in big bands before as well. And he asked me to come play with one of uh, the rehearsals he was doing for his band. And I, you know, I didn't know him and I wasn't really sure whether I should do it or not, but I thought, you know, it's always good to meet new people and make connections and so I said, sure, let's do it. And um, and then I started playing in some shows that he did with his band. Anyways, our relationship continued. And he is very involved in the composing and film world. And often he conducts the scoring sessions, which is the recording session for the film. And so finally it happened where they needed somebody the main guy wasn't available. He put my name out and I got the call. And so the very first scoring session I got to do was for the Lego movie two. And that was at the Warner brothers scoring stage, which is huge. A full orchestra was there along with me and a whole percussion section. It was so many people. And I actually had this really beautiful solo that I got to play and everything turned out really well. I was very nervous, but it did turn out well. And since then, I've gotten to do a few other really interesting film projects. Um, A special note is the Mr. Rogers movie that came out with Tom Hanks a couple years ago called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. 
and that has a very piano heavy score by composer Nate Heller and I got to do nearly all of the piano work for that film so that was very exciting that was a very big recording moment for me (laughs) and since then I've done a few other projects here and there but that's kind of the story of that. Okay so you also worked in academia so explain to the listeners what that is. Yeah academia so I have a lot of education. (laughs) I have all the way up to a doctoral degree. So I got a what's called a doctorate in musical arts. So abbreviation is DMA. And that is basically the artistic equivalent of a PhD. So it's a PhD for the arts, you could say. So not only have I been in school for a long time, but then after that, I taught in schools for quite a long time. I taught at There's a school here in California called Chafee College, and that's where I first started teaching at college level. There's also a school called Musicians Institute where I taught. Um, And then I was also able to actually start a piano program at Los Angeles College of Music, and that's in Pasadena, California. I was offered the opportunity to create the first classes, the first curriculum for this new piano program. And that was a very exciting opportunity. And I, you know, I was able to hire the first faculty members and recruit the first students. And that was all a very big deal. And I did that for a few years, but it was also very, very time consuming, as you can imagine. And it was at that point in my life and in my career that I realized just how much I really loved to perform and to compose and to be a creative. Not that there's not creativity in teaching, but I really wanted to focus more on the other side of things. And so after doing that program for a few years, I turned in my resignation. You know, I just said, I need to go my own way. And since then I haven't looked back and I've just been doing really more of the creative thing. And I've been so happy ever since. Yeah, it's been a good switch. Well, that's great. So for the listeners who who might not understand or might not know, explain what it's like to record an album. Oh, it is a long process. There are many, many steps involved. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, at the very beginning, you got to have the music, got to write the music. (laughs) You got to have something to record. So the first process is really just writing songs and even that has many steps to it and and people do it differently so you could ask someone else and you would get quite a different answer I'm sure but my particular process is I write everything at the piano and I typically record it just on my phone or something simple on on my phone I have something called uh voice memos and I use that a lot And that allows me just to record quick snippets of the song. And then eventually I start adding more snippets and they start to grow. And when the song is somewhat fleshed out, at that point, I will write it out using notation. And probably at that point, too, I might bring it to the band so that we can try it out as a group. But I don't typically write songs with a group first. I start with my own personal concept. Now, again, a lot of people do it differently. But so once we have, you know, enough songs, however long you, you know, an album can be, however, but typically I try to have around eight to 10 songs for an album. And so once the songs are ready, you know, we'll rehearse them, we'll rehearse them. And then we need to book some days at a recording studio. And this is a really thrilling thing to do. Because it just there's something very special about the recording studio. It just kind of got, there's a magic to it when you walk in these places. They always have these big rooms, typically with lots of wood or, I don't know, interesting little touches. And of course, all the expensive audio equipment and just everything. And they're just very special. And so we typically will go in for about two days to record an album. And um. I could go on and on about this. So I'm not sure how much you want want me to spend talking about this. But the bulk of recording an album is 
the initial creative process, which is writing the songs, and then actually going into the recording studio where we then, I guess you could say, finalize the songs. And then after that are what is called the post-production. So I could get into that if you'd like, but I will defer to you. I don't know how many questions you have today. <laughs> That's basically the mix and master and, and, and stuff like that. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So explain to us about your new album and and why it's different than any of the other albums you've released. Okay, everybody, it's Michael E. Cullen II. And I'm Sesame Encarta from the All Too Real 2 podcast. We're passionate about movies, TV, and pretty much all things pop culture. Dive into the chaos of failed sitcoms, direct-to-video sequels, and the quirky realms of cinema and TV. Join us every Thursday for your dose of All Too Real 2 entertainment. We'll guide you through debates like whether Howard the Duck qualifies as a superhero. Ponder if Larry the Cable Guy could be the new rock or Schwarzenegger. Discover if some shows and movies should have stayed in the cutting room. Ever heard of a sitcom featuring that dictator with the funny mustache? Well, we watched it. We're dedicated to unraveling the peculiarities of pop culture, sometimes with awesome guests. So, if you're into the eccentric world of pop culture, listen and subscribe to All Too Real 2. Available wherever you find podcasts and on Age of Radio. Yeah, well, this new album, it's called Keyboards, and I called it that. It's kind of, it's a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's because it really is about keyboards, all, all the different classic keyboards that are featured heavily in music from the 70s. And I just love this era of music, especially the jazz funk stuff that like Herbie was doing. Um, there's the band called Stuff with Richard T. and Steve Gadd which I just love so much, highly influenced by that band. Uh, and I have started growing my own personal keyboard collection, <laughs> starting to need more room. But um, I have a Fender Rhodes, a Wurlitzer, a clavinet, and these are all vintage instruments that are actually from the mid-70s. So not only am I emulating the 70s in the sort of style that I'm writing, but I'm using instruments precisely from that era, which is just really cool. And my husband, Jake Reed, who's a drummer, he also used a drum kit from the 70s. And we used a lot of mics, period mics from the 70s. And, you know, we tried to, to do as much as we can that was period accurate. But the way I was writing for this album was very different as well. It was much more focused on the sound sort of the sonic sensibility, you could say, whereas before I was perhaps more focused on the composition. And I was writing, previously I was writing much more complex compositions, much more involved. Not that there's anything wrong with simple versus complex. You know, there's no right or wrong way to write, is what I mean. But the songs for this album are... They have simpler forms, simpler harmonies, but the focus is on the groove and the feeling, the style. And I just really hadn't had sort of a concept album like that before, you know, so focused on the 70s, so focused on these instruments. Um, so it really was quite a departure for me, but I I am having so much fun playing in this style. So I'm hoping to do another album just like it pretty soon. Well, tell us about some of your biggest musical influences oh gosh um well if we just start with the pianists um if we go back a ways Ahmad Jamal was a big early influence for me especially his live at the Pershing album just his style of arranging was so unique to what I had heard before it was almost like pop music Everything was really so tightly arranged and there were all these sections and lots of dynamics. The thing about jazz is, depending on the era, I suppose, but there can be, you know, at a certain time, a lot of the songs where you'd, you'd play the, the melody and then there'd be a lot of improvisation. 
and then you'd play the melody again. But the focus was on the improvisation, the unknown, and all of that is fascinating for sure. But the way Ahmad Jamal would do it was more focusing on the arrangement. There was definitely improvisation going on, but it was very tightly fit within the arrangement. Not so loose, I guess. And I just found, I was very attracted to that concept. And I think that that has, you know, certainly influenced my style of writing. Um, and then after him, the big ones were certainly Herbie Hancock, who has so many different eras. <laughs> um, and Keith Jarrett was a big influence. Brad Meldow, Oscar Peterson. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, there's a lot. Herbie, I think, is especially interesting for just how many different styles he's gone through himself personally, which I really admire in an artist, be able to sort of reinvent yourself every decade almost. And, you know, certainly his electric stuff, like the album Thrust, I really enjoyed. And that certainly influenced a lot of the sounds on this current album. Well, tell us about the most rewarding part of composing new original music and entertainment projects? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, there's just being able to write your own music is certainly a thrill, but there is a next level thrill to hearing that music come to life with a band and hearing reactions from an audience, from fans. It's been really, really amazing and rewarding to connect with all kinds of new people, especially over social media. And to realize that the music really does have an impact and really is meaningful to other people. And it's very encouraging to keep going. You know, I mean, I think sometimes when you're just sort of alone in your room and you're writing or, you know, whatever your art form is, it can be, you know, you have to wonder what's it for. But this is, you know, it's it's been really really rewarding to have found an audience for this music and you know I think it's also encouraging just to keep going and keep trying just to find the next thing you know just keep going <laughs> and yeah so I, I always try to write in a way that's true to the moment in the sense of like you know I have to be feeling something to write and that's, you know, that's the whole thing about waiting for inspiration to strike, I guess. But for me, it's more like waiting for the mood. And the mood can be anything. I mean, if I'm sad, I might want to write something. If I'm elated, I might want to write something. But if I'm feeling nothing, nothing's going to come out. And, you know, there's days, we all have days where we're kind of just blah. And then other days, we're feeling very intense emotions. And that's usually when my really good writing comes out is when there's some, some, sort of emotion coming. But what's been really fascinating is to find that whatever the emotion is, it connects with others. Like, it's amazing to me that if I write something when I feel happy and I put it out, the feedback I get is, wow, this song makes me so happy. Or if I am feeling something more intense and I put it out, I get responses like, oh my gosh, this song was so intense. <laughs> so it's, it's really fascinating how it translates. So tell us what advice you would give young, upcoming, aspiring musicians out there. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I would say certainly be yourself, which is harder than it sounds. <laughs> but but in along the same lines, I would say don't worry so much about what everyone else thinks or don't worry so much about what everyone else is doing. And that, that really, you know, is about being yourself. But I, I know that I personally spent a lot of time comparing myself to others in the sense of, oh, this, you know, this person is doing that. Maybe I should be doing that. Or maybe I'm supposed to be doing that instead of really just asking myself, what do I want to do? <laughs> but again, you know, with the social media, it's very easy to get wrapped up in oh, look at this person, they're doing this big gig, you know, how come I'm not doing that gig? Or whatever it is. But you have to make sure that you take a moment to reflect and ask yourself, do I even want that gig? Do I care about that gig? 
And so really what I have found, even though, you know, it's taken me a few years to really understand this deeply, but now I am much more comfortable being, you know, in line with, I basically, I ask myself a question, you know, if something is coming up and the question is, does this thing make me happy? And I also sort of ask, does it align with my goals? And those seem like pretty simple questions, but it has resolved so many issues, you know, because I think sometimes I was concerned about doing the right thing, but whatever expectation I had about what the right thing was, was perhaps not necessarily my personal truth. It was, I was trying to be someone I wasn't. So in that sense, it's like figuring out what you love and doing that thing is going to bring you the most happiness and the most success, I think, because it's your true north. You know, if, if, however crazy it is, like if you just want to go make cheese in a cave, you know, whatever, go do that. If that, you know, if, if that's going to bring you the greatest happiness, then that's what life is about. And I think you should go do it. But it is hard because if we get these messages like, well, making cheese in a cave is not what normal people do. Well, who cares what normal people do? <laughs> you know, you got to do you. You got to do what's what's right for you. So that's what I would say. Absolutely. So when your audience listens to your music, what do you want them to feel? What What kind of emotions are you trying to strike up in your listeners? Well, you know, it varies. Um, I mean, certainly with this last project, I really just wanted people to feel good. I mean, this is a feel good project. This is about just kind of getting down to some grooves and hanging out and just feeling good. And, you know, a, a bit of nostalgia because of the seventies thing. Like, you know, I want, you know, certainly there's vinyl is so popular right now. And, you know, I think we all kind of have nostalgia for the past because <laughs> things are moving so fast. But so there's a bit of that. Um, but, you know, I think I just, I want people to feel joy when they hear my music because music brings me joy. So I would like to share that with others. Well, tell us about any current upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Well, um, I'm going to release a single over Labor Day and I'm working on kind of the next keyboard style album, but I'm going to add guitar to the next one, I think. So it'll be a quartet, but it'll be similar. Like I'm really enjoying this sort of jazz funk, really groovy style. And I'm still writing pieces in that, in that style. So I, I have more to say. <laughs> so I am going to, I think, put out another album, but I also hope to release, you know, it's interesting. I get a lot of feedback about my solo piano pieces that I put up on Instagram and yet I don't have a solo piano album. So I would like to do that. And I'm going to, I think, explore a little bit of that and we'll see when that comes out. Speaking of your Instagram, th throw out your contact info so, so people can find your music and keep up with everything that you're up to. Oh yeah. Yeah. Please follow me and always feel free to connect and leave a message. My Instagram is just my name, K-A-I-T-D-U-N-T-O-N. -T and that's my, the same thing for TikTok or Facebook, whatever, wherever you like to hang out, you'll find me all with the same name. But you have a website or you just got your social media? Yep. Website's the same thing. So just my name, K-A-I-T-D-U-N-T-O-N.com. And you can, uh, again, you can contact me there. You can buy some of the new vinyl. I've got all kinds of other stuff, sheet music, t-shirts, <laughs> all kinds of merch. Um, you can check out the upcoming tour schedule there, you know, browse any of the music that I've put out. It's got a lot of stuff on the website. Check it out. Okay. We'll close this out with some final thoughts. Maybe if that was something I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about it, just any final thoughts you have for the listeners. Oh gosh. Um <laughs> I don't know. I would just say that, um, you know, for anyone who is listening, who is curious about the music, 
you know, I, I hope you'll check it out. And I do always love to hear from you. I love to connect with fans, with the audience. And it's really, it's people like you. It's people who listen, people who, you know, follow me or come to shows. I mean, you are the inspiration for me to keep going, to write new music. And I just really appreciate every one of you. And I'm just so grateful. And for you too, Curtis, I'm just happy to be part of all of this. So I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Oh, well, I definitely uh, appreciate you uh, as a fellow artist and appreciate everything that you're doing. And listeners, you will appreciate Kate's music. So go check her out, katedundon.com. Make sure you check her out and, you know, check her out on your favorite streaming platform and keep up with everything that she's up to. And if you have any guests or suggestion topics, C. Jackson 102 at Cox.net is the place to send them. As always, thank you for listening. And Kate, thank you for join, joining us today and sharing your talents. Oh, thank you, Curtis. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.